The landscapes in Geopark Western Newland are impressive and varied. They were formed by ice, water, wind and people. Here you can experience a large part of the history of the development of landscapes in Denmark. Landscapes that were left behind when the ice melted. From the rough North Sea, where waves batter against the coast, to the calmer Limfjord with its many bays and beautiful islands. Fertile moraine landscapes and sandy heathlands with plantations and wide open spaces. Here there are meltwater plains and hill islands, wet and dry landscapes. In a brief, a world-class ice age landscape. But there are also much older landscapes in the geopark. In the lowest part of Ulbir Cliff, as well as in three chalk pits, you can see layers from the Danian interval that are between 65 and 60 million years old. Geopark Western Yulan contains traces of the last three ice ages, Elsterian, Salian and Vicelian. The land was not always covered by ice during the ice ages. For long periods of time, the area was ice-free and covered by tundra. The last ice age, the Vaishselian, started about 115,000 years ago. It lasted for about 100,000 years. The ice advanced several times and from different directions during this period. Most of the landscapes in Geopark Western Yearland were formed during the main glacial advance that took place between 23,000 and 21,000 years ago. Large glaciers pushed their way through the landscape, bringing clay, sand and stones with it. The glaciers formed terminal moraines and meltwater plains that are important elements of the landscapes in the Geopark today. The main stationary line, the limit of the glacial advance, marks the widest extent of the Weisselian ice sheet. This line passes through the Geopark here in the west and Karup River in the east. From here it extends southwards to the border with Germany. The weight of the ice pressed the Earth's crust down below its level today. Meltwater flowed down through cracks in the glaciers and formed powerful streams under the ice. These subglacial streams formed four tunnel valleys in the Geopark area. When the meltwater reached the front of the glacier, it cascaded out onto the meltwater plain. Strongly flowing rivers wound their way across the landscape and formed extensive meltwater plains. The rivers transported large amounts of stones, sand and clay. The hillis land at Linde and Murbo stood out between the rivers on the open meltwater plains. They represent moraine landscapes surviving from the next to last ice age, the Salian. Other noteworthy landscape elements developed as the ice melted, like the beautiful valley at Traibo. Large blocks of ice remained here and there in the landscape as the glaciers melted. They melted much later and gave rise to so-called kettle holes. The area around the lakes at Flunasu and Stubago has many splendid examples of kettle holes. Sea level was much lower than today during the last ice age you could walk from Denmark to England in what is known as the Continental Period. The tundra landscape was like that in Arctic areas today. When the last ice sheets in Scandinavia and North America melted, sea level rose rapidly and large land areas were inundated. The North Sea was formed. The sea was more extensive than today 
and the low-lying area became drowned by salt water. There is evidence for this rise in sea level at several places in the geopark. Coastal cliffs formed by the Littorina Sea, or the Stone Age Sea as it is also called, are easy to recognize. When the ice melted, the pressure that it had exerted on the underlying strata was removed. The land began to rise again, very slowly. After some time, the elevation of the land overtook the rise in sea level, and areas of marine foreland developed. About 5,000 years ago, the area covered by the geopark closely resembled that we have today. The west coast in Geopark Western Yearland is what is known as a simplification coast. It is a coastline that is strongly influenced by the forces of nature. The power of waves and wind erodes material from headlands and transports huge amounts of sediment. This material is deposited where conditions are calmer. Headlands become eroded and material is transported along the coast where it forms sand spits that gradually separate bays from the sea. Sand spits gradually become isthmuses that completely cut off the bays from the sea so that they form coastal lagoons. Limfjord became entirely separated from the North Sea about 800 years ago. Powerful storms in 1825 and 1862 broke through the isthmus. A channel was formed at Tuburum. This gave direct access to Limfjord from the North Sea. Many different forms of coastal landscape are developed in Limfjord. Norskor V at the northern point of the island of Vinu is a so-called Kaspate foreland. It was formed when spits advanced towards each other and merged. At Gila U, it is easy to see how the evolution of a recurved spit is in the process of developing newly isolated beach lakes. One of the places where two spits have not merged is at Osun, where two substantial spits approach each other. The southern spit is straight, whereas the northern one is recurved. There are many splendid examples of different types of landscape and coastal features in the geopark that were formed by ice, water and wind. And there are many places where you can be inspired to see and interpret the landscapes. At the end of the last ice age, large animals like mammoths, Irish elk and bison grazed on the extensive tundra plains that covered much of the western Yearland. It was during this period that the first people ventured into the area as nomadic hunters some 14,000 years ago. The temperature gradually increased. Woodlands developed that covered most of the landscape people began to settle along the coast where they could fish and hunt in the woods. About 6,000 years ago, people started to clear the woodlands and to develop agriculture. The New Stone Age, or Neolithic period, had begun. Conditions for agriculture were particularly favorable along the main stationary line from Bobier to Karup River, and many settlements consequently developed here. The soil was a mixture of clay and sand and was easy to cultivate and quite fertile. Many barrows were built near the settlements during the Stone and Bronze Ages. The barrows that were established on ridges and hilltops were used as landmarks. They became used by travelers who transported goods from landing places on the coast to their inland destination along the ancient road. The ancient road followed relatively high land and provided the easiest route through the landscape without too many wet or steep passages. There used to be more than 1,800 barrows along the ancient road. About 560 of these can still be seen today. Traces of old wheel tracks can be seen in several places. 
Until about 800 years ago, Limfjord was open to the North Sea. Fleets of Viking ships assembled here before leaving on sea journeys. Churches began to build here when Christianity displaced the Nordic gods. Most of the Nordic churches in the Geopark were constructed in the 12th and 13th centuries. They were built using large stones that glaciers had transported here from elsewhere in Scandinavia. A total of 2,000 large dressed stones, called ashlar stones, were needed to build a church. Several monasteries were built in the area during the advance of Christianity. During the Middle Ages, there was a convent and a water mill at the village of Guzium, God's home, today called Guum. The water mill at Remastran also belonged to the convent at Guum. Further east, there were remains of a convent at Stua. Here, nuns lived on a small peninsula on the shore of the lake at Stubago. There was also a monastery and water mill at Zvis. The monks here knew how to dam the watercourses and use water power to drive a mill. The mills were important, both to grind corn and as stamping mills to wash and process wool. The raising and export of live steers became an important industry in Denmark in the 15th century. West Uland farms had large fertile meadowlands that were ideal for the raising of cattle. Steers became an important product for trade and played a significant role in the development of the area. The steers were driven in herds along the Drover's Road down through Uland to markets in Riba, Kolling and northern Germany, where they sold mainly to buyers from Netherlands and Germany. The steer trade continued until the mid-19th century when the transport of livestock was carried out by ships from Limfjord and later by train. By the 17th century, almost all the woods in western Uland had been cleared and wind-blown sand became a constant problem. The light sand was blown inland from the dunes near the coast. A single strong storm from the west was sufficient to totally inundate fields of sprouting crops in the spring. Many families were forced to abandon their farms when their crops were destroyed by drifting sand. The dune landscape west of Husby Plantation gives an impression of what drifting sand can achieve. Here, there is a large parabolic dune that illustrates the enormous amounts of sand that can be moved by the wind. In the middle of the 19th century, attempts were made to restrict the movement of sand and plantations were established. In 1856, the church at Husby was in danger of being buried by drifting sand. Four local farmers went to Copenhagen, where they were received by the king, who they asked for help. The king sent a forest ranger to help the local people establish a plantation that largely consisted of mountain pines. Today, more than 160 years later, pine trees are being cleared in several places to re-establish the dune landscape. Clearing the woodlands resulted in an expansion of the heathlands. The establishment of plantations in the second half of the 19th century was accompanied by attempts to cultivate the heathland. These infertile sandy areas were made into arable land by the addition of marl, chalk and fertilizer. Chalk was not only used to improve the fertility of heathlands. Since the early 18th century, chalk had been excavated and fired in kilns for both agricultural and building purposes. Today, the abandoned chalk pits and mines are important information centers and provide homes for maturing cheese and bats. There are several small fishing communities along the harsh west coast. 
you had to be very tough and hardy to work as a fisherman on the West Coast. Drowning tragedies were not uncommon. Many fishermen were involved in rescue attempts where they put their lives at risk in attempts to save the crews of stranded ships. This eventually led to the establishment of one of the first lifeboat stations in Denmark. The tough conditions forced many families to move to Limfjord, where they could fish in calmer conditions and establish new communities. Waves, currents and the wind constantly eat away the west coast and move large amounts of sand. When the churches along the west coast were built in the 12th century, they were about one kilometer from the coast. Since then, the powerful erosion of the cliffs has resulted in the churches now being close to the sea. In 1825 and 1862, there was another violent storm that opened the lagoon and made a new breakthrough Limfjord and the North Sea. This gave rise to the canal at Tuberhun. It has since become the gateway between Limfjord and the North Sea. This breakthrough was very significant, both in the historical context and for the natural environment. Access to the North Sea meant that the towns like Lemvi and Struer could blossom as ports and trading centers. The gateway to the North Sea also meant that Tuburn flourished and a fishing harbor was built here in 1915 to 18. Tuburn is now one of the most important fishing harbors in Denmark. In an attempt to protect the sand spits at Harbua and Aga Isthmus, a large number of groins were built between Fjautring in the south and Aga in the north in the period between 1817 and 1962. Today, the artificial supply of new sand is the main method used to reduce erosion along the west coast. There has been, and still is, an important link between the landscapes and the people that live here. Fishermen have replaced their small boats with robust fishing vessels. Farmers have replaced their scythes and horses with modern harvesters. The landscapes continue to be modified by powerful forces of water, wind and people. And the challenges of climate change will require major efforts in the future. The many stories about the landscape, nature and history make the Geopark a place to be experienced. Its location between fjords and the sea provides a wealth of opportunities for everyone, regardless of their age and interests. There is room here for challenges, learning and playing and togetherness. The many attractions in the Geopark and knowledgeable local guides offer experiences where you can discover how the area has developed into that you see today. Like the artists that were here long before you, let yourself be inspired by the magnificent landscapes, the fresh air and the special quality of the light. Geopark, Western Newland offers many exhibitions and artists and not least the beautiful landscapes that inspired the artists. Here you can explore some of the largest continuous areas of nature in Denmark. One of the largest herds of red deer in the country has roamed through the plantations and heathlands since the Ice Age. Beavers were reintroduced to Denmark in 1999 in the Geopark. They have since spread over a large area. You can, of course, experience many other wild animals. Thank you.
Nature provides the opportunity for gastronomic experiences. Whether you just pluck berries or are entertained by a chef that uses local products, red deer, mushrooms and tasty berries from the woods. Your meal will taste especially good if you choose to eat it in the open air where you can appreciate the wonderful landscape together with some good friends. Here there are sheep at the edge and a close relationship between grazing animals, wild plants, wild animals and birds. In the harbours and along the coast, you can enjoy fish, shellfish and oysters. There are opportunities for a wide variety of outdoor activities in beautiful surroundings. Here you can cycle on your mountain bike or get a shock of adrenaline when you paraglide over the cliffs at Bobia or Toftom Biaoya. You can walk or cycle or just enjoy the peace and quiet. The air is fresh and the sea is wild on the west coast. While inland conditions near lakes and streams are calm and peaceful. Here you can sail or catch your own fish. Take a trip on an oyster safari or a seal safari in Limfjord. You may choose to start your exploration of the geopark at the information tower at Åsun. Here you can learn about the local geology, art and cultural history and enjoy wonderful views of fjords and meadows. Regardless of whether you want culture, gastronomy, peace and quiet or an active holiday, there are almost limitless possibilities in Geopark Western Newland. Here, there is room for everyone, and it's only your imagination that sets limits. <laughs>